Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, 2.52 p.m., June 29, 2022. We start with the Trinity Journal, Philip Durstein's article on the ancient Israelite calendar. And he's been arguing uh, about its history. The gamut of Talmudic literature takes for granted the validity of the sighting of the first evening crescent as the criterion for the beginning of the month. However, from the time of the Mishnah through the 10th century AD, the rabbinates of Palestine and Babylon sought to convince Jews of the diaspora the importance of human authority for setting the new month as though local Jewish communities had no business relying on their own traditional methods. The Mishnah, 170 to 220 AD, indicates that the formal sanctification of the new month was done on the strength of actual observation, which points to an empirical system. Some believe the special calendar court, whether it existed or not, was instituted as a means of convincing others that the rabbinic affirmation of an observation was more important than the sighting itself. Ergo, sacred time was now determined by humans, not by nature. The rabbinical court, Beit Din, was given sole authority to regulate the calendar and thereby control the very existence of the festivals. This was an important milestone in the development of a Jewish calendar based exclusively on calculation. The challenge of pre-calculating future first evening crescent visibilities with any kind of consistency led in the 4th century AD to calculation of lunar conjunctions as means of defining new months. Prior to this, there are lunar dates that point to the use of empirical criteria in a light-based system. For instance, the intersection of data from Josephus and the Seder Olam indicates that the second temple was burned on the eighth day of Lewis, the Macedonian month corresponding to Ab, the fifth month, A.D. 70. This month began on July 28, the crescent being visible the previous evening. Eight days later, on August 4th, the Sabbath, Titus gave the order to set fire to the outer court of the temple. This date was indeed eight days after the first crescent visibility of June 20, July 27. This is just one more de- demonstration of the value of of lunar visibility tables as a witness to the credibility of astro-calendrical data and ancient sources. Now for Anglican Episcopal History, an article on historiographies of the Lambeth Conference. Historiographies talking about Davidson's book, The Origins of the Lambeth Conference of 1867 to 78. However, that event described today as the first Lambeth Conference was not convened in order to become the first of anything. Despite the enthusiasm that it generated among many participants, it concluded without any clear sense that such gatherings would become a recurring reality. To the contrary, it was not uncommon that attendees envisioned the 1867 meeting as the starting point for developing something else, a council that regulated the entirety of the Anglican Communion. Committee Report A, which encouraged the creation of provincial synods, was not alone in noting quote, the need of a generally felt united council in a sphere more extensive than a provincial synod. 
Many who gathered in 1867 did not want another conference at all, but something else. Consequently, the Lambeth Conference did not become a subject of recurring historical study until it became an institution. After 1867, it was far from obvious that another conference at Lambeth would occur. But such a request came in 1872 and again from the bishops in Canada. It soon received further support from the bishops in the West Indies and the United States. Nonetheless, uncertainty remained. Longley's successor, Archibald Campbell Tate, wrote in 1875 to the Bishop of Pittsburgh that he brought the question of a second Lambeth Conference to Canterbury Convocation. The relative article A rather than the is important here. Even with the goodwill generated in 1867, there was no necessary reason for believing that support was forthcoming, especially from within England, as several English bishops refused to attend Longley's 1867 gathering. Tate's invitation in 1877 denoted <coughs> a second Lambeth conference and thereby revealed no awareness that this follow-up meeting might develop into a permanent institution. But in Davidson's words, it was virtually settled at the conference of 1878 that a third conference should be held at Lambeth ten years later. Lacking a communion-wide synod, the Lambeth conference was effectively established in 1878. It treated as precedent the determination of an Episcopal conference, now seen as the first Lambeth conference, that had met in 1867. The earliest historic historiography of the conference was thus produced after 1878. We speak of the Lambeth Conference, Michael Ramsey, and his involvement in that. They've been giving his career heretofore. Even before his travels began, Ramsey saw that the balance of world Christianity was already shifting from the west to east and the north to the south. The meeting of the World Council of Churches at Evanston, Illinois in 1954, he noted the growing leadership of the churches in Asia already and perhaps the churches in Africa very soon. Though they still needed Western help, neither the churches nor the countries will suffer Western domination. They are rising to adult stature. They are the teachers and we are the learners. Let African and Asian missionaries come to England, Ramsey told the Anglican Congress at Toronto in 1963 in something more than a rhetorical flourish, to help to convert the post-Christian heathenism in our country and to convert our English church to a closer following of Christ. As in Ramsey's travels, as Archbishop quickened to deepen his understanding of the situation, how <clears throat> detected, detected a quickness of his understanding at depths far below the outward appearance. Writing to the theologian E. L. Moscow, 1905 to 1993 in 1966 concerning the ecumenical situation in Nigeria, Ramsey stressed the importance of studying the potentialities of the African mind in developing Christian forms and not to judge everything by Western concepts. And Ramsey had learned to look beyond written formularies and to see unity in these total sociological terms. Lambeth 1968 was Ramsey's second Lambeth conference. 
He attended the 1958 conference as a relatively new Archbishop of York. But he already knew something of such global ecclesiastical events, having attended the first meeting of the World Council of Churches in Amsterdam in 1948. Having a keen sense of Anglican history, he contributed a foreword to a history of the first Lambeth Conference in 1867. We'll continue that in our next edition as we turn to Lambeth Conferences and International Relations. The tradition of natural law and the work of Anglican divines presented important foundations for such thought, but yielded little development in terms of international relations. Richard Hooker, 1554 to 1600, committed a few brief pages to the spiritual commerce and mutual communion of Christian nations. Observe observing the importance of showing hospitality to travelers from foreign countries and urging the importance of general councils to order the Christian world, something that he founded established in the practice of the apostles. In the context of the English Civil War, Joseph Hall, Bishop of Norwich wrote, to make a war just there must be a lawful authority to raise it, a just ground whereon to raise it, due forms and conditions in the raising, managing, and occasion of it. Evidently, nobody saw fit to develop this statement in the 18th and 19th centuries, perhaps because the territorial realities of an island nation with a growing empire were not the same as those of restless, of a restless continent where wars occurred not abroad but at home. In truth, Anglicans who later sought to speak of the law of nations found that their own tradition provided no certain ground on which to tread and no framework or body of thought to which to refer. They could only look directly back to the Gospels and convert what sayings of Jesus they found there into premises for international conduct, much as they applied them to questions of other kinds. Anglican writings on war and peace rested on biblical interpretation, not always erudite and profound in character. This pursuit of what was truly Christ-like left them with a great deal to build for themselves. And now we shift to Protestant Reformed Journal, the editor's note. The special issue on sexual abuse, May 1, 2022, was read by many so much that the RP, RFPA made a special run of 750 additional copies to supply those who requested them. Churches and individuals, both of our regular readership and those who do not subscribe to the magazine, ask for copies. There's a limited supply still available. Please write the editorial office at gritters at prca.org or the RFPA, Alex Carlsbeek, rfpa.org. The articles hit home in a most literal sense. Sexual abuse victims exist in our homes, the homes of Protestant Reformed readers and our friends. Many of their oppressors have lived there too. As we said in the May 1 issue, at God's behest, we've begun to dig a hole in the wall Ezekiel 8, to see what evils are performed in the darkness. God promised Ezekiel that he would spare those who would sigh and cry over the uncovered filth. 
Her special issue was the beginning of the public cry. Letters from readers magnify that cry. We print some of them in this issue. We heard from many more than those whose letters were printed here. A sincere thanks to everyone who responded. We heard from the abused. We heard from the families. We received letters from their friends and protectors. We heard from pastors both within and without the PRC in North America and abroad. Thank you to all for taking the time to write when silence may have been easier. All the letters were signed by the authors. Some of them we publish without the writers' names, for obvious reasons. There are also the families of those caught in the sin of sexual abuse. We hear their cries, too, of sorrow, pain, shame, confusion, utter perplexity. The burden is so heavy, the adversity is so painful, the way so crooked. God hears your cries, too. I was stunned to read what I call, can only call a wonder-worked confession from one of the readers who was very personally involved. God is so gracious. I wish everyone could experience God's grace like we have, but without the depths of a valley. We truly can say we are closer to God and closer to each other. Someday, soon, May that experience of the victims, as well as all those who suffer from the agony of abuse. Now we got some letters. Here's a one letter. Thank you for, from the depths of my heart for this special issue on special sexual abuse and standard bearer. Wish I could say we literally fight over who gets the standard bearer next more often in our home, but I have to admit that is not the case. But when this issue arrived, if the person whose hand it was set was in set it down for a moment, there was someone else waiting to snatch it up. It had a positive impact in our home. Seeing this in print in the standard bearer shows in a large way that there are people out there listening, watching helping, caring, loving, believing, trusting, and learning. This is huge for victims. People are standing up on behalf of those who simply aren't able and saying that this abuse is not okay. It is hatred. It is hated and wretched in God's eyes and even in man's eyes. This brings so much healing. We let abusers among us know this is not going to be covered up. Hopefully this helps abusers to see the ugliness and turn from the temptation. I thank all who are involved in making this issue happen. Those behind the scenes, never mentioned. The writers, the proofreaders, the dear victims, survivors, and their hard not to be told experiences. Even the artist who drew the cover, the picture was so powerful it made me weep. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, and 23. Know ye not that ye are the temples of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? <clears throat> if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are, and Christ's. We serve a mighty God. He is faithful. Name withheld. Here's another letter. This is on the article on sexual abuse in the Standard Bearer in the May edition. We're in the June edition. Thank you for the recent special issue of the Standard Bearer on sexual abuse. It is obvious that a great deal of thought and care went into the organization and production of this issue. Sexual abuse is a difficult topic to address. It is grotesque, evil, heartbreaking. It is a, a subject we shrink from, afraid to look at directly, lest somehow we be tainted by its ugliness. 
An issue completely dedicated to abuse is a hard issue to read, but it is also very necessary and a timely issue, one that must be read by God's people. Though our family has not been touched directly by sexual abuse, it has touched the life of one that we love as our own. By the grace of God, she too is an overcomer. We have learned so much from her and her family about abuse, but more importantly, we've witnessed and been amazed at the testimony to the sustaining power of God in their lives. Lives that were shattered by this great wickedness, but have been rebuilt by the wondrous love of our Heavenly Father. Upon reading the different articles, one quickly notices a recurring theme. This is a beginning. Much work must still be done. We have much to learn as a people, as churches. And so, to be encouraged, keep working, keep writing. We must face this evil directly and root it out of our churches. God demands that of us, our covenant children, young and old must be protected in doing so we will receive blessings from the Lord name withheld turn now our attention to table talk uh, the a second here the July edition of table talk the theme is salt and light and we have a weekend devotional, and we pick back up with our exposition of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19, Honoring Elders by Dr. William Van Duyweer, Professor of Church History at Greenville Princeton Sem Seminary. I'm sorry, Greenville Presbyterian Seminary. The beauty of God's order for Christian life and community shines in the faithful care for church leadership. In 1 Timothy, the apostle instructs Timothy on how the church should see its ordained elders. Let the elders who rule well be considered of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. 5.17 Simply holding the office of elder is not reason to be regarded with honor, but elders who serve faithfully, and particularly those who minister the word, are worthy of double honor in the church. Giving double honor means honoring faithful elders in their service and honoring them through financial provision, as becomes evident in the next verse. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out grain, and the laborer deserves his wages, verse 18. John Calvin reflects that, that if it is cruel for an owner to fail to provide for a working animal, how much more intolerable is failing to pay pastors adequately. The Apostle reaffirms in his other epistles, let no one who is taught the word, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches, Galatians 6.6. 6. When we think of all the blessings we receive through faithful ministry, how can it not be our joy to provide generously for those caring for us? Another aspect of care for elders is care when criticisms and allegations are made against them. Quote, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5.19 Faithful gospel ministry will at times result in hostility. Faithful elders are to be protected against slander, but there may also be accurate charges against an elder. The biblical pattern of requiring two or three witnesses, which can include people and other evidence, stands in unity with the Old Testament teaching of Deuteronomy 17.6 and Christ's teaching in the Gospels, 
of Matthew 18, 16. Sadly, evil men sometimes take advantage of what is intended to protect the innocent, to try to minimize or avoid consequences. Wrongs can be compounded through failures of justice. The church, in holding its elders accountable, is to do so with loving and determined faithfulness. Well, hello, inspiration by the word. Good to see you. This is Rocchio. Okay. Hi, Rocchio. <clears throat> the fact that elders are accountable in life and doctrine is made plain by Paul. Quote, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. 1 Timothy 5.20 Faithful care of elders not only warns sinners, but it lovingly protects church and community. Paul reminds Timothy that an aspect of faithful discipline is so that the rest may stand in fear. Trembling at the consequences of sin is healthy. Our high calling to honor elders through care, protection, and accountability is made plain by Paul's concluding charge to Timothy in verse 21. In the presence of God in Jesus Christ and the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Following Christ's call by the apostle honors God as it honors faithful ministry and it brings beauty and blessing to the whole body of the church. Now we turn to the reading for July 18th on the fourth commandment, hallowing the Sabbath, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. As we continue our study of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, let us note that these laws are draw address the most fundamental aspects of human life. For instance, the fifth and seventh commandments provide essential guidance for family life by preserving marriage and parental authority. The eighth commandment by outlawing theft provides a key regulation of the economic sphere of our existence. The first, second, and third commandments all have import for religious life. In the ninth commandment, we find essential guide for maintaining all relationships by promoting truth. And the tenth commandment calls us to keep our thoughts and desires under control when it prohibits covetousness. The sixth commandment helps keep life it go itself going by establishing structures for protecting innocent lives from harm. Today's passage shows that even time itself is a concern of God's law. We're talking, of course, about the fourth commandment, which we find in Exodus 28 through 11. God in these verses commands his people to remember the Sabbath and to hallow it by refraining from ordinary labor on the seventh day and final day of the week. The reason for this is highlighted in verse 11, which points to our keeping the Sabbath as part of our imitation of God. Just as the Lord in his creation labored six days and rested on one, we are to do the same. Thus, as one commentator has noted, we are directed to pattern our time after God's model. In so doing, we are implicitly directed to orient all that we do according to our Creator's own rhythms and set apart a portion of our time, one day in seven, for a special remembrance of the Lord and for a particular devotion to Him. Worship on the Sabbath, then, is part of the fourth commandment is indicated in the close association with the Sabbath and corporate praise of God's people that we see in such texts as Leviticus 23. In Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, 
the Sabbath is closely associated with divine rest, and thus our need to rest on the Sabbath is emphasized. When the Lord repeats the commandment in Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, he refers to rest as well as his rescue of Israel from slavery in Egypt. This connects the Sabbath with redemption. It's no wonder then that with the coming of the new covenant, believers began celebrating the Sabbath on the first day of the week instead of the seventh. For Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week for our justification and thus our salvation. Matthew 28, 1 to 10, Romans 4, 25. And now for July 19th, our pleasure on the Sabbath, Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight of the Lord, and a holy day to the Lord honorable. Christians within the Reformed tradition have agreed that the new covenant Sabbath is the Lord's day, and therefore we are to gather for corporate worship on the fourth day of the week. Since the Sabbath celebrates the redemption of God's people, since the greatest act of salvation occurred when Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week, the new covenant Sabbath should be observed on Sunday. Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, Matthew 28, 1 to 10, the resurrection account, and then Revelation 1, 10. Although Christians have agreed that Sunday is the new covenant Sabbath and the day on which they should gather with other believers for corporate worship, they have disagreed regarding other aspects of the Lord's day. In particular, Christians have debated the place of recreational activities on Sunday and whether that can be a part of properly observing Sabbath rest. Some have taken the view that the Sabbath we are to engage only in worship, rest, deeds of necessity, and mercy, which is the view of the Westminster Standards. Activities required to sustain life or alleviate suffering, such as medical facilities, nursing homes, fire and police departments. Others have generally agreed with this, but include within the sphere of rest what might be considered recreational activities, such as playing games or engaging in other amusements. We lack the space to get into a full debate here, but it is important to note what both views hold in common, namely that we are to give careful thought to what we do on the Lord's day. It is a day set apart and not a day to be treated as just another day off from labor. Truly, we are to honor God with, throughout all of our life, but the Lord's day is to be hallowed as a time where we give special thought to our Lord's character, God's plan of salvation, and the state of our souls. And we'll draw that to an end here. The Lord be for us, who can be against us. God speak till next time. Good to see you all here. We'll be back shortly.